Olá. Bom dia. So today's, today's language of greeting is Portuguese. All right. Um, I thought I would continue from where we left off yesterday. Um, see, the Lorenz equations were written down in 1963 or thereabouts. And uh, those were the days of uh, very uh, slow, slow computers and so on and so forth. But since uh, in the last 60 or so years, um, there's been a huge, huge amount of uh, both analytic as well as computational work on a variety of, uh, of the Lorenz system and various other attractors, um, which I will talk a little about today. And uh, the Lorenz is like the hydrogen atom of chaos explorations. So a lot is known about it, be partly because A, it's quite simple, and the other is that um, you know, it, as you build up more experience, there is a lot more to understand about the system. Okay, all right. Um, so the idea of attraction to some set, which is not a point, not a circle, on which the motion is chaotic, namely that it shows sensitivity to initial conditions. This is like a crucial idea in complexity that. Different initial conditions still give the same final result. Okay. Uh, and there are lots of ramifications of that. Okay, but uh, the system is simple enough, so one can actually uh, try to uh, look at it from what we were doing for two dimensional systems. Uh, you can find the fixed points. There is one fixed point always uh, which is stable up till the value rho equals 1. And I will occasionally switch between rho and r. Okay. Uh, so uh, the second uh, two fixed points, these are two actually, um, uh, they exist only above rho equals 1 on the real axis. So the behavior of the system has largely been expo explored as a function of rho, keeping other parameters fixed. Okay, and this is a schematic of a very complicated um, bifurcation diagram. So as you vary r, that is if you're varying rho, uh, initially zero is the only fixed point. At r is equal to one, there is a bifurcation making zero, um, uh, uh, zero becomes unstable and these two fixed points, they're called C plus and C minus, uh, they become stable. So the idea is that there is one branch which is going out from here and another branch which is going out below. I'm just not, this is the symmetry in the system because this, uh, there is this, the Lorentz system has the symmetry uh, that it is invariant under this transformation. Uh, X, Y going to minus X minus Y. Z being, okay. Between uh, 0 and 13.926, which is a, actually a precisely calculable number, uh, there are only fixed points in the system. Okay, there's one unstable fixed point and two stable fixed points. So if you look, the, sta the, uh, the, the two stable fixed points have got different basins of attraction. And uh, zero has, I mean, zero, of course, is fixed over here. So the whole of space just collapses into these two fixed points. No matter where you start, you go there. Uh, uh, sorry. Huh? So this symmetry is not absolutely evident. Which, this one? Yeah. Or oh, just algebraically evident. Yeah. No, Z is not, you see, ah, okay. it's my X, Y, Z going to minus X, minus Y, Z. All right, so at 13.926, there is a, a bifurcation 
leading to the following situation, that the, uh, there is an unstable limit cycle, and this, this point continues to be stable. Okay, so there is this bifurcation that happens over here. And, and this unstable, uh, sorry, the unstable limit cycles, they are actually born out of an unstable fixed point, which then becomes stable. You can see the dashed lines are all unstable. The solid lines all indicate stable. Um, and this is called the hop bifurcation, namely when a stable fixed point crosses a certain, at a, at a particular point, as you change the parameter, the stable fixed point becomes unstable, and there is a stable limit cycle that is born. Okay, we will, I will consider one, the Stuart Landau system a little later, uh, and I'll show, show you how that happens on the board. Um, okay, so that is actually reversed over here. Right, so you have this fixed point, stable up till this value of whatever R, R H for Hopf, and then that becomes unstable. Right? Now, for this particular uh, system, it turns out that up till this value over here, 24.06, I mean, these, these are both important and not important, meaning other systems will obviously have very different kinds of um, bifurcation diagrams, they will have a whole different, uh, you know, zoology to look at, all right? But you have a strange attractor which is born at 24.06, and that goes on. But for a very brief period, the strange attractor coexists with two fixed points. Some initial conditions take you to the fixed point, some initial conditions take you to the strange attractor. Right? And these have very interesting topologies to look at. Okay. As I've already told you, there are, uh, this is the values that uh, Lorenz settled on. And these were really nice uh, because R is equal to 28. There are no fixed points that are stable you only have the strange attractor, right? And uh, if he had chosen a smaller value, there would have been a more you know, complicated kind of, uh, I mean, it, it would have been very difficult to get so much interest in this business. His whole idea was to try to prove that the weather is aperiodic and therefore uh, not predictable. You know, weather forecasting is not, not an easy science. Okay. But, okay. Uh, the, I mean, there are many things. If you plot them in three dimensions, they settled on to a complicated step. But um, this strange attractor is not a point. It's not a curve or even a surface. It is a fractal of some kind. Uh, the word fractal is okay with everybody? Yeah? No? Okay. Monday. No? See? Small introduction, but Monday. I mean, right now I want to do something else. Okay. Yeah? I still don't understand what an unstable limit cycle is. Um, why there are? What? What is an unstable limit cycle? Like an unstable fixed point. Um, Okay, uh, let me look at the following equation. Okay, so if I look at this particular, and, uh, okay, so here obviously there are three fixed points for this equation in R, 
which is r is equal to 0, 1, 2. Yeah? R is a radius, always positive. I don't understand the T. I think for now it's just. Yeah? yeah? Is it just by construction? Hmm? So now if, if I've got R, if I'm just looking at R, this is 0, this is 1, and that is 2. These are the fixed points just along the radius, right? Yeah, no, it's okay. Unstable. I'm sorry, I come up with these slightly silly examples, but you, you can expand it. Yeah. I think uh, I know what kind of, I know what um, factor is there more or less, but I think there's probably a good way to say that that's just Gibson factor. Like this mean the Gibson factor. Because in my mind, I have a Gibson factor in my mind, I have a factor that's not just Gibson. Yeah, um, OK. You see, you, here you've got a trajectory which is on some surface. Okay, so let's go just by elimination. Is it, can it be a one-dimensional, you know, can the trajectory go trace out in one dimension completely? No. Yeah? Important point is that at any point, there can be one and only one trajectory. So even though this curve seems to be crossing and crossing and crossing itself all the time, it cannot be crossing itself. It cannot really be crossing itself. So the, the surface, you know, this flat thing that looks like a, the wings of a butterfly, right? There's actually many, 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 I mean, there's an infinite number of layers over there. The, the trajectory goes back onto the same parts of space, but without ever intersecting. No, we're looking in 3D. I mean, that's perspective 3D. This is a perspective diagram in 3D. When you look at it, this uh, trajectory is never repeating, and it is occupying the same part of that space. Right? So one thing we know is that it cannot be a two-dimensional surface. Because if it was a two-dimensional surface, it would have to cross itself. You go, I mean, it, it's many steps from there to it is, so it is a fractal. But I'm just saying it is a fractal. It has that fractal geometry, which is why it allows the trajectory to explore many, many, you know. If you, if you cut this in a straight line, Right? You, if you just cut one of those wings of the butterfly by a straight line, you would not see two points only. You'd find actually many, many, you know, many layers. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And then you can measure and whatnot. It's not, uh, some of these things are very difficult to prove mathematically, actually. Uh, uh, so. In my mind, the idea I have of geometrically of a fractal is that not kind of a figure that. Self similar. Similar when I zoom in and out. No. No. <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> if you're seeing it, <laughs> you know, stop taking what you're taking. <laughs> <laughs> It's fractal in the way in which, you know, if you, if you cut it, then when you start looking at it, you'll find that it's all going on different layers. Okay. All right. Um, see, the last part of it, the Lyapunov exponents can be calculated for this system. And as I told you, as I just asserted yesterday, there are three of them. Uh, the three come because of the following fact that there are three equations of motion over here. So this entire system is, it starts out in R3. Then there is an at attractor and it brings you down to zero volume. Why does it bring you down to zero volume? Uh, is because uh, you can see that the divergence 
of the, the divergence of the, uh, this vector field over here. Right? You've got that vector field over there. You can calculate its divergence. It is just sigma, uh, sorry, it's minus sigma minus 1 minus beta. Minus sigma minus 1 minus beta. That, the, the, the sum of those three terms is the uh, divergence, which is that. Now, in a theorem which has been proved by, you know, a long time ago, uh, the sum of the three Lyapunov exponents has to be that, all right? So it, it turns out that one of them is positive so long as rho is bigger than 24.74 something, all right? That is, I'm sorry, I should, okay. So, so at least one of them is positive from this point onwards. What do you mean with the things can be bigger? That is a whole other story. I mean, it is something that for a very, very long time uh, is unrepeating and so on and so forth. And then I'm not even sure what finally happens, but uh, that, that's how long it goes on. Right. OK, an, another system, yeah. Because you're working in three dimensions. No, that, that, I didn't say that. There are three Lyapunov exponents because you're working in three dimensions. But it is not as if you can associate one with x, one with y, one with z. What happens, I mean, what you can show is that you must have three Lyapunov exponents. That's one, one uh, assertion. Second part is that uh, because of, there is only beginning now, there is some understanding of what these Lyapunov dimensions are. You know, why, why, what are these three of them? Because the transformation between that and, and the uh, x, y, z is not simple. Right? So it's not as if, you know, in the x direction, if a positive Lyapunov exponent, everything is blowing up in x. That's not how it happens. Right? Uh, in, in the, um, again, in the... Lorentz system, uh, all these three coordinates are all mixed in one, one into the other. So it's not as if you have evolution only in x, only in y, only in z. Right? So the, um, oops. What's the definition of? Okay. Okay. So a little time out before I come to the other system on the board. So practically, how you how you you study this system, you've got these three equations, which gives you the orbit, the, the ones that I've been writing down: sigma y minus x, whatever that is, right? Now. The Lyapunov exponents are computed, as I was trying to give you schematically yesterday. You start with a unit vector, right? And see how that grows along the trajectory, right? So to calculate the unit, the, and this unit vector is, you know, is, uh, it, it is estimating the slope at each point. So it's actually going along the tangent. Right? You've got the trajectory itself, and the growth of this unit vector that you have is determined by the tangent. It's in tangent space. So for that, you look at this equation, delta x, delta y, and delta z. This is just looking at the linear motion. So if I, uh, see, let me write down the Jacobian. It's minus sigma, sigma, 0. And the uh, z uh, x uh, what's it x minus z plus I uh, sorry minus z plus r um, 
it's 1 minus 1 and with z it is x. Right, and the third one is uh, y, x and minus beta. Okay. So this is the Jacobian. I've just taken, you know, just taken, uh, if I call this f sub x, is partial of fx with respect to x, partial of fx with respect to y, partial of fx with z, and so on and so on. So that's, and then you fill in the others, and you get a matrix like this. Okay? So what I'm going to be interested in is looking at the dynamics of displacements, where delta x dot, delta y dot, and delta z dot is given by this Jacobian times I mean, some of this must be familiar, right? Okay. So now I have to start with a unit vector. Now, this unit vector could be 1, 0, 0. It could be 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1, any of these. So what I do is to start with all three of them. So this is my equation for the Lorentz. Now I come up with three evolution equations, three sets of the tangent vectors. So here I get, let's say, the first one. Then similarly for the second, and similarly for the third. I mean, there are many ways of doing this, but I'm just describing the way in which it's computationally the most straightforward to look at. You start with three unit vectors, and as they move along the trajectory, they will change from being the three orthogonal ones to some point over here. At that point, you ask, right? What you ask is, how much did they change in, in the direction x1, in the direction y1, in the direction uh, Z1, etc., etc. Then again, you make them, you use Gram Schmidt orthogonal, uh, you, the Gram Schmidt procedure, you bring them back to length one. But now they are not pointing in, let's say, in, in XY, they're not pointing in these directions. They're going to be in some other directions. Then they evolve around the trajectory again. And here again, they have changed. Okay, maybe they're looking like whatever. And then again, you normalize, bring them back, and you follow the trajectory as it goes around, each time going a certain length, seeing how much the length has changed, and so on. Yeah? So when you do that, you will find that there are these three quote unquote directions, which initially, of course, it started out as x, y, and z. But because of the way in which the evolution takes place, you find that they are just three of them, not particularly with x or y or z, because the flow mixes these directions up. Yeah? See, sometimes, uh, I mean, staring at equations and trying to calculate it is, is a good way of doing it, of trying to get some intuition about it. So the main point is that if there are only three uh, Lyapunov exponents and one of them is positive, then everything is going to expand along that direction, but that direction keeps changing as you go around the trajectory. Okay? And there is another direction which is severely contracting because uh, the divergence of the whole vector field is uh, something like this. It is e to the, uh, what's it? The volume will go as volume naught times e to the 1 plus uh, beta plus sigma times t. And for the parameters that you've chosen, it's uh, um, 
sigma is 10, so that's 11, and beta is 2, uh, 8 by 3. So, uh, you know, those are the ones that I said, we use them in the calculation. Uh, so it's something like 13, right? So at each time step, the volume is decreasing exponentially by a factor of e to the minus 13, right? That's why it, the volume is going to zero, but it's not going, I mean, it could go on to zero if it was going into a two-dimensional plane or onto a one-dimensional line, right? But you can see that it cannot be a two-dimensional plane. Yeah, all right, and so this is the sort of the natural place where fractals start making their presence felt. Okay, now there's a simpler set of equations called the Rosler equations, uh, which some of you may not have seen before. Uh, I mean, Lorenz, I think everyone has seen, but Rosler is not quite so common. Although it is much simpler, there's only a single uh, there's a single term which is uh, uh, which is nonlinear, and that is uh, the x z in the third equation. You have x z. Um, unlike the other systems we've been looking at, um, zero 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 is not a fixed point. Uh, there are two fixed points for this system, and uh, one of them is the one marked in red over here, okay? And there's another one somewhere out there um, that doesn't have any interesting dynamics around it. What is nice about the Rossler, um, okay, and here's this part, the flow actually is not confined to a folded two-dimensional surface, it's rather to a folded disk of finite width. Um, there's, there's been a lot of work on the Rossler systems, but uh, even though it's relatively less familiar. Right. Okay. Now, uh, the point about the Rossler is that if I view it from above, that is, if I project everything down to the x, y plane, that's what it looks like. Right? Uh, the motion is always circulating about this point. Of course, it, this is just a flat projection, right? It's always circulating about that point, right? Uh, and so, it's, it's, uh, but it's chaotic. Even though it's sort of circulating about the point, it is chaotic. And I just thought I would show you one little demonstration. Oops. Okay, so two initial points that start out close enough, but slightly differing in Z. And you can see that the way in which Uh, hopefully, this will also give you some intuition of Lyapunov stability. This is not Lyapunov stable. So we started out together, but then the trajectories are really evolving differently. But um, is that okay? No. <laughs> See, the point is that for you, if you choose your epsilon, you should say how close delta, how close they have to be, and it's sometimes it's not possible to define it this way. And they have to be small, in any case. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the point that I was uh, asserting over here that the orbit keeps circulating around and around and around. Yeah? Okay. Now, because it keeps circulating around that point, 
it is actually possible to think of defining something like a phase. Because this orbit, if I just project it onto the xy plane, is going around some point. And I can just ask, what is the value of tan inverse y by x? Supposing I think of this as some polar representation. And people have actually done that. That you define the phase as y by x, the arc tan of y by x, and then ask, how does that phase behave? Because the phase would be normally defined for a cyclical orbit, right? And for that, if you use some kind of polar coordinates, it's always tan inverse y by x. So just taking that, hence, if I just ignore the amplitude variation in these various cycles, this just begins to look like motion around a circle because I've forgotten the radius over there. And if I'm just looking at motion around a circle, it comes back with a little more algebra to the Kuramoto model. OK? So you should not be surprised to know that if, I, if instead of taking n coupled phase oscillators, I take n coupled Rosslers, I will also find something like the Kuramoto system. I mean, it's not obvious that it happens, but it, it actually does. And the part of the motivation is the uh, uh, is is the fact that it goes around the circle. All right. Just a second. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. OK, so the argument really is just by visual inspection. You can see that, uh, no, just one second. Let me get this. That, that was the last of. OK, it's, it's just the following. You see, now you're going around some particular curve over here. Now, it's, it, it never happens, unlike the Lorentz system. In the Lorentz system, we were going back and forth, you know, going in positive x, negative x, positive x, and so on. Similarly in y, z was always uh, positive, right? But here, z is, I think, always positive as well. But you never find the trajectory crossing, changing its orientation or its direction. So now if I forget about the distance from the point of circulation, I just have something that is moving around a circle. And so I can replace, the, you know, I can just say ignore the radial direction. I'm just looking at the circulation. That gives me a phase. And so if I have only a phase, then you know, I think about all the other nice systems which have about only a phase. Kuramoto comes up. Yeah? Okay. okay. Uh, yeah? So, in both these cases, Lorentz as well as Rosslas, the general schema cases say that it starts accelerating towards the fixed point, and then it comes sufficiently close, it jumps out, and then. Okay, it doesn't. Uh, see, this is. Uh, it, some of it is a little optics over here in the sense that this distance of where it has to come before it goes further up is, uh, I'll just try to show you what uh, that is. See, just how far it will jump when is not easily determined by the distance from the illusory fixed point. I mean, it, the, the fixed point is not actually in that plane. 
I'm not sure, and I don't know the precise scales, but you can see now how erratically it seems to see the Z being large or Z being small. I mean, that's where the chaos is. No, but, you know, it, there is probably some region in the three-dimensional space which is more uh, expansive than others. See, these, these exponents are not uniform all over. Um, I will, I mean, maybe after the class, you know, after the lecture, because I want to get some, some of these other things out of the way. I want to introduce you to the idea of chaos synchrony, right? Um, but we, we, one can discuss It's not uniform. You can see that, right? You saw how it you know, suddenly it runs up and goes. Yeah, but I was seeing like every time it goes up and goes past. Yeah. That was the point. That's why you can define a phase. Because if it went up and then came down and circulated over there, then you wouldn't be able to define the phase. It goes up and then goes down and goes round and round and up and down. Yeah, it is an interesting question, though. Is there some proper surface that one can? Uh, maybe we can talk a little more when, with, with some more calculations. Yeah. All right, so uh, let me get to, you know. OK, part of the reason I introduced chaos before coming to the idea of synchrony is that you already know, to some level, what synchronization is. We saw how thing, you know, oscillators of different frequencies can pull each other, they drag each other, and then as you keep increasing the coupling, they have identical motion after a while, right? Or they can have antiphase, which was another manifestation that we saw. But we've seen this both for the case of maps we've seen it for the case of uh, one dimensional flows you know the kuramoto and so on the real surprise about synchronization as a paradigm uh, came about when it was discovered uh, experimentally and theoretically more or less the same time uh, that you could have synchronization in this system and this was an observation in, you know, in the 70s and 80s, all right? Okay. Now, you've seen this picture before. This is what the Lorenz attractor looks like, an orbit, a typical orbit in the uh, Lorenz attractor. It looks like that. And um, one could imagine, okay, one can imagine that Regular oscillators can synchronize quite easily. We had all those examples of circle maps and so on and so forth, that it could have anything. But what uh, it's most commonly known with the name of Pecora and Carroll, but it was already done earlier by Fujisaka and Yamada, and um, also maybe even earlier uh, by Afraimovic and others and so on. You know, I mean, people have been worrying about not precisely synchronization, but interacting oscillators and so on and so forth. Okay, Afraimovic uh, was a Russian who lived in Mexico, I think. Large part of his career was in Mexico. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, fact of interest. <laughs> okay, so what uh, Pecora and Carroll did was the following. They said. Let me take two Lorenz oscillators, okay? One of them is got the variables x, y, z. The other has got the variables x prime, y prime, and z prime. So I'll make two perfect copies, all the parameters identical. And I know that if I start this um, with one set of initial conditions and this with another set of initial conditions, 
they're going to just go wherever they go and so on. Right? We saw the example where I showed you that different points are eventually attracted to the same, same strange attractor. So different initial conditions should not coincide, um, but, uh, you know, and they just evolve on their own. But now what they, uh, they suggested was, in the second of these equations, change x prime to x and or wherever, wherever x prime appears, just say that instead of taking it from this equation, you're going to take your input from the output of that. Okay? So the unprimed system becomes the master. And it gives the signal of x to the slave. So this is what is meant by master-slave coupling. Yeah. But why the x prime? Why the in the x dot prime equation there's not an x? It doesn't matter because whatever the x variable does over there no. is <laughs> just doesn't matter. It also becomes x. <laughs> okay. So this I'm, I'm going to sort of show how this is actually. You can put it in the framework of various different things, but when people talk now about master-slave or pecora carol, all right, um, this is what is meant. That some variable or some sets of variables from one system are given unidirectionally to the other system, and that's it. Yeah? Okay. Now, just to show you how beautifully it works, right? Um, I think this is for the this variable is y, okay? And what you see is what I've done is to take the two copies, green and purple, and I make uh, I make the purple the master at some point t equals ten. See, initially, they are independent of each other. They're moving around. And because of sensitivity to initial conditions, the green and the purple are just on the same object, but evolving differently. At this point, we mix them. We make one the master. And after that, you can see you know, very, very quickly, uh, it's just impossible to tell the two apart. The y coordinates becomes identical. The z coordinate also becomes identical. And as a matter of fact, just one second. Oh, no, I don't have that particular curve. But if I, if I look at the distance between z and z prime as a function of time, that just exponentially goes to 0. So the difference between z and z prime just vanishes. Difference between y and y prime here sort of visually vanishes, and x, who cares? Right? But the dynamics is still on the Lorenz attractor. Because, see, the dynamics of the master is unaffected by whatever is going on in, in the slave. Right? So the motion is on the Lorenz attractor is just that this other attractor has been brought, you know, the x prime, y prime, z prime, they've just been made to coincide. So, right now, the, cru the, the crucial thing that, they, that Pecora and Carroll also discovered when they were doing this work was that this system of equations has got three Lyapunov exponents. If I follow this through and you know, go ahead and do it, I'll get three Lyapunov exponents. Effectively, this is now five equations. Right? So there are five Lyapunov exponents. So when they computed the five Lyapunov exponents, what they discovered was that uh, 
interestingly enough, if you have these five Lyapunov exponents, three of them are the same as the old ones because that dynamics is not changing at all. But then you've got two more. And whether they synchronize or not depends on the signs of those two extra ones. If the two... Okay, I've already said that if you have one Lyapunov exponent that is positive, you're going to be chaotic because the distance is going to grow exponentially fast. Right? What, what goes on when you now couple, couple this in this way, and you ask why do they synchronize, there is some other dimension out of these five dimensions, I, you know, I, 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 it's difficult to visualize, but in two of those dimensions, the Lyapunov exponents relevant to those extra dimensions are both negative. If that is so, then you can synchronize. In particular, if you couple them not by making the x signal the master, but if you made y the master, so that is to say, have these equations, but now with changing this to y, uh, this again will not matter, uh, and uh, you know, and this particular one make this also y, and x prime y. Yeah. So if if you make y the master, and in this geometry, it doesn't work because the subsystem, these are called these additional two Lyapunov exponents are called the subsystem Lyapunov exponents. Those are not negative. Yeah? So, uh, and this plot we showed uh, uh, in the same initial condition for both sections or different initial conditions? Totally different. Okay, so FI is uh, the integration in any prime variable? Yeah. Converge to the chaotic trajectory. Right. But if I made a representation for x, not prime, mm -hmm. so maybe it's linear like that, right? Because the dimension. Uh, not in Lorenz, because Lorenz is globally attracting for all. So if I found, okay. okay. Uh, no, I, I won't. I see, I'm, this is just a phenomenological. Uh, you know, part of it was engineering, part of it is. Um, you know, it, it, there was some idea that you could use this in secure communication uh, because uh, you take, a, take an, a chaotic signal um, and because it's chaotic, nobody can predict it. You mask a message with this chaotic signal and have it received by somebody and then you, you tell them, hey, I was using Lorenz with these parameters and eventually they should be able to figure out what is what's the actual message, right? Chaos plus message minus chaos is equal to message. <laughs> it doesn't, I mean, it works, obviously, but it's not good enough, all right? So it, we haven't, you know, you can't now try to get off of, uh, you know, Facebook knows this. <laughs> they, they're, they're, they know what you're thinking anyhow, right? <laughs> but okay, to the point, I just want to say that, look, this is something which is a control method, all right? Because as, you know, just, just to see how it goes, uh, but I'd like you to see it a little more in the following way, okay? So here is your master and here is the slave that has come, but the master, uh, and the copy of the master is these up till here where all the variables are only the primed variables. Yeah? Now consider that I add these two extra terms. Okay? So without these two extra terms, here is your slave. And the addition, additional terms that have been added in red over here are like what the, you know, that's the coupling. And it's a coupling with a control objective. Namely, uh, there is this entire branch of engineering called control theory, uh, where you say that if I want my objective to be that y is equal to y prime and so on, there is a way of trying to do the calculations and figure out. So, but 
this is the kind of coupling that will, effectively it will do the following. It will give you these equations, what Pecora and Carroll wrote down as the slave equations. Right? Or you can say that here is, uh, here is the slave system, and I'm going to make a coupling, a, three a, a, a vector coupling in uh, three variables. The first term is zero. The second term is uh, whatever you, what are these two things that you see over there. Okay. Right. So if I was to try to think about it. Um, as I'm going to do in a little while, but let me just give you the idea over here. If I look at these master system, and let's just call it x dot is equal to f of x. Okay, these are three. f of little x is just equal to uh, f is equal to fx, fy, f z. Okay? I'm just compressing all the notation that here is master system. Here is my, here is my system that is eventually going to become the slave. Yeah? Just, this is just notation. So, what I've written over here, this is the first equation over here. X, capital X is just little x, little y, little z. Capital Y is x prime, y prime, z prime. Right? And the right hand side is, this is fx, and this is, uh, and sorry, and this is fy. Now, the question that I'm asking in the control method is, let's leave this one untouched. What is the coupling, and, and for later use, I'm going to be calling this zeta. So here is my coupling, and it is a function of both x and y that I've added over here. Right? And this zeta, in our particular case over there, is all I'm, I'm suggesting that this is to be seen as 0 x minus x prime plus rho, z, oh, sorry, not plus, multiplied by rho z prime and x minus x prime times y. Okay. So this gives you a, a coupling. And if you want to write, you can also write down over here zeta x of x and y, right? where this is just 0, 0, 0. OK, so what I'd like you to see in these equations is that both the primed and the unprimed variables have both been changed because of the coupling. If you don't couple them, they're just going independently all over the place. You add two coupling terms. And what's the coupling term that you want to add? For the x variable, or for the sort of unprimed variables, you don't add any coupling at all. For the primed variables, you have specifically this one. Now, the other day, I think Thomas was asking, is there only one, or can there be more? Or let me just you know, pose the question, how unique is zeta y or zeta x. It turns out actually that it's not unique at all. There are essentially an infinite number of different couplings that can bring you down onto the kind of dynamics that you want to see. All right? But just a little more work before that. Yeah? Right. So I think it's sort of fair to say that one should be, this was like a huge surprise uh, that you could actually synchronize chaotic systems because everyone said sensitivity to initial conditions, they should be pushing you off all the time. But then it turned out that 
it's actually amazingly trivial to get them to synchronize. Right? Um, but still, it's, it had its moment. All right. Yeah? You always look like you're protesting something. <laughs> 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 no, 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 it's fine. <laughs> I teach at a university in India which is known for its protests. <laughs> Go on. On X? Oh, you can, you will. Uh, I mean, I, what I want to show you, I want to sort of work, this is just 1990. Okay, when you come to 2020, you will have added all sorts of terms. People have just explored all sorts of... See, these are couplings. These are, gen these are couplings, right? So people have... If you, if you can think of a coupling, somebody has surely worked on it. Right? And depending on the kind of system, the couplings are different. Right? The simplest one is uh, like what one observes with you know, two pendulums uh, swinging in phase and so on. Uh, so that is one simple coupling, which then we just take the first term and the sign is just x1 minus x2, something like that. All right? uh, I mean, believe me, there, is, there are reams of paper that have been used in writing this. Okay. I want to talk about another kind of synchrony. See, once it was discovered that you could make chaotic oscillators uh, synchronize in this way, uh, you naturally then went on to all the chaotic systems that you knew. And when you looked at the, uh, the Rössler system over here, okay, and I've just put in some numbers for the constants in this uh, the story. Uh, this number y, oh sorry, omega over here, does actually play the role of the phase uh, frequency, all right? Okay, so that will tell you how you're moving around, at least in the x, y direction. Uh, yeah, all right. So what they did was to look at this system, uh, two of these systems, all right, uh, with whatever. And the coupling between the two systems is just this capital C times x1 minus x2 or x2 minus x1. The other way around. Yeah? See, the, sorry. The original equation just has got omega y minus z, and the coupled equations has got omega y minus z. Oh, have I made a mistake then? Yeah. Well, one of these Zs is wrong. <laughs> right now, I don't remember which. <laughs> no, Lorenz, I recognize instinctively. Right. And then I've got these terms over here. This is, this is the coupling. Right? Okay. So the coupling term over there. And then let me describe to you what's going on over here. What's plotted over here is the Rössler oscillator in the xy coordinates, right, for one of them. And here it is in the xz coordinates, right, same. So this is, we've already seen that in the, in the little demo. Here are the x, y, and z variables as a function of time for a single oscillator. If I just plot if, if I write down one of these signals as an amplitude times a phase, in the way in which I describe the phase, y, tan inverse y by x, okay, the difference between the phases when the coupling is small just keeps increasing. The difference between them, the phases just drift away from one another. As as you increase the coupling, the phases now take these sort of long passages of being almost identical, but then you have these things which are nowadays called phase uh, slips. Okay, so you have a phase slip, 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 and it just goes up in steps. And as you finally increase C to whatever value this is, you find that the phase difference doesn't change. Namely, they are 
having an identical phase as a function of time. Okay? So the amplitudes themselves are highly uncorrelated, but the phase difference actually goes to zero. And what uh, Pikowski et al. did was to, first of all, give it a name. So this is called phase synchrony. So, the, so if you want to think in terms of the oscillators, it's not as if the two trajectories are identical, but these go up and down at essentially the same time. Right? And this is actually a very common uh, kind of synchrony that is, which occurs in nature. So it obviously got a lot of attention. Uh, for example, when you look at population dynamics, in many cases you have the fact that the populations are highly correlated, but obviously the amplitudes of the two different populations can't be the same, or are frequently not the same. So while they go up and down at the same time, as oscillators, the amplitudes are very different, and therefore the idea of phase synchronization is important. I mean, there are many biological organs. You know, I think our breathing, uh, I don't know, there, there's something to do with the breathing mechanism and the pulse or some, you know, there are all sorts of phase relations between that. Yeah? Uh, so the coupling is a term that applies from zero to one, or what is the rank of coupling? Um, I don't know. I mean, see, the, the point is that this coupling is somehow uh, trying to, it's trying to alter the dynamics, and it depends on the scales of the problem. Uh, so here, the omegas, um, I don't know whether it was taken as one. This is not my calculation. I'm just, you know, reporting from a standard, from a standard paper. Uh, so the coupling will depend on the particular values of these parameters. But these parameters are chosen such that the dynamics is chaotic. In this system, actually, you can have periodic orbits as you keep changing, uh, as you keep changing this number 10. This number 10 is one of the parameters of the, of the game. So when, that, when 10 is very small, thinking of 10 as a symbol rather than a number, so you think of that particular that constant over there is very small, then you have periodic orbits, and once it crosses some value, for example, when it's equal to 10, uh, then you have chaotic orbits. For that, then the range of C may be something else, meaning that you know, these all depend on a certain amount of analysis that you have to do. Yeah. Then it becomes negative. It becomes yeah. So you can recognize almost always looking at the Yeah. You can almost always recognize by looking at the Lyapunov exponent. But the, which kind of thing? The system will also, as you keep increasing C, um, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, as you keep increasing the coupling, you will actually go to complete synchronization also. Okay? So phase synchronization is sometimes just called a weaker form of synchronization. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't get to you. Absolutely, they go. Okay. Okay. So um, just a little blow up of the two trajectories. Here is a case when they're not coupled, when 10 is small or zero, when that parameter, oh no, when, the, when C is zero, the two of them are just totally uncorrelated. Uh, when you have phase synchrony, right, you can see over here that they are essentially in phase, although the amplitude of oscillation is down. And then finally, when you have complete synchronization, the, the trajectories just coincide, yeah? Over here, what I've done is to give you the same information, but now looking at the coordinates of the two oscillators. 
So this is x1 versus x2. This is just x1 as a function of time, and x2 as a function of time, also drawn one on top of the other. So here, this results in an uncorrelated mess. Here, the fact that they are in phase gives rise to some sort of interesting curve. It's, it's not a mess, but the phase relation between the two sort of plays out because the amplitudes are not correlated. If the amplitudes were the same, then, uh, then you get this. Right? Yeah? I'm, I'm, I seem to remember that reading some paper which has even that, all right? But then it will always be discovered that, you know, it, it's generally observed that you know synchronization, phase synchronization, amplitude synchronization. But I, like I say, I, I, don't, I don't know every, in fact, most. Okay. So... Um, here is, uh, here is another plot of systems that are completely uncorrelated with one another. Right? So here is a map, a chaotic map, your standard logistic map, uh, where x goes from 0 to 1. And uh, here is the other system also going from 0 to 1. And if there is no correlation, uh, the points are the purple ones, just all over the place. Now, on the other hand, if the points are in fact correlated, right, if they are identical, then they will all just fall on that particular line. And that line, I mean, it's obvious that they will all fall on that line, but I just want to point out that that line is a subspace of the square. Okay. Now, if I take two Lorenzes, and now I'm going to just couple them with epsilon x1 minus y1. So this is my, sorry for jumping between notations, because I need to have this notation to do it in a little more. OK, so here x, y, z has just become x1, y1, x1, x2, x3. And then this is x prime, y prime, z prime, which has now just become y1, y2, y3. All right? I'm not doing. Pecora Carol, but I'm just adding this term, epsilon x1 minus y1, to the first equation, and over here it will be epsilon x, x2 minus y2, sorry, y1 minus x1. Just flip it around. Okay? I mean, there isn't, you know, you can, it, the coupling doesn't matter precise form. I'm just saying that I'm coupling the two, and I want to look at what the dynamics uh, does. OK. When they are uncoupled, you get the purple blob. I've just plotted uh, x3 versus y3, right? x3 versus y3. And I'm just looking, they're completely uncorrelated with one another. And I just get that mess over there. Okay, it's not uniformly covering that space, but given enough time, it will probably get there. Yeah? Okay. Once I couple them, and uh, okay, if I couple them for small values of epsilon, they are still not going to be. Um, identical. In fact, that's the orange mess over here. Okay, so I've coupled them, but the, the motion is not synchronized, and you get there. Uh, but if I increase the coupling and I finally get synchronized motion, that lies on this thin green line that you see over there. That because that is just z uh, sort of x three equals z uh, y three, right? I'm sorry, you know, this is the z variable in the, in the primed and unprimed uh, this thing. So 
And the way to recognize it for me is now just that is, this is the one that is always positive. Right? So what the coupling does, and when you come to synchronization, you again come down onto the straight line in, uh, in now the straight line is x3 versus y3. Similarly, there is another plot you can make for x1 versus y1 and for x2 versus y2. And again, the fact of synchrony will be a straight line. Yeah? We will, we will just come down to that in a moment. I, I just want you all to see this is the same fact of orbits looking like they're the same on top of each other and so on. But now I just say that as far as x1, x, uh, sorry, uh, x3, y3 dynamics is concerned, before synchronization, it's all over the place. After synchronization, it's on a line. The same for the other two variables, x1, y1. So I want to just make this statement. The whole dynamics is taking place in a six-dimensional space. X1, Y1, uh, X, uh, X2, Y2, X3, Y3. It's a six-dimensional space. But after, after the whole synchronization process is done, we are on a subspace, which is X1 equals Y1, X2 equals Y2, x3 equals y3, which is just, if you think about it, there are three requirements out of the six spaces. So the eventual dimension of your flow is three. Yeah? I'm going to come to how we design coupling, you know, I mean, part of, this is, okay, this is some, a little bit of what I do. No, yeah. Right now I'm just talking identical. Absolutely, you can make the, all, all those variations, but it will still be a lower dimensional sub-manifold. All right? The, the point is that the process of synchronization just, you see, I've, I've talked about how it is a method of control, how it is, a, you know, a, a fact that you, you can also talk about it as a method of constraint, right? So it is reducing things down to a lower dimensional space, right? And as far as the manifold business is concerned right now, it's just that the synchronization manifold is just the space on which the eventual motion takes place. That space is given by the coordinates x1, you know, the, by the condition x1 equals x, uh, sorry, this was, uh, x3 equals y3 times x2 equals y, uh, y2 times x1 equals y1. Yeah? Don't ask me what the shape of that manifold is. Because, I mean, we are looking at a subspace of six-dimensional space. I'm already lost at three. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, uh, what I want you to get is the idea that synchronization means confinement to a lower-dimensional lower sub subspace. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, so, if one asks the question, generally, how do sy systems synchronize, then... The large part of all these is, says that systems can be mutually coupled to one another, as we have seen in this last example. The term x, x1 minus y1 adds to all, adds to both the systems, right? Or, as we saw with Pecora and Carroll, you've got the master driving the slave, right? And there's a third interesting paradigm, which is that both these systems can be controlled by one boss. All right? And when you have this condition of both systems being controlled by 
a third system. This is actually quite, not only, I mean, it's the one that we are most familiar with, namely the circadian. All organisms on this planet have that, they get tuned to the circadian rhythm, right? And we take, all of us take it directly from that satellite there. Not satellite, after Copernicus, but... <laughs> Yeah, but you get the idea, right? Everybody starts looking at their cell phone, that's, that's again coupling to some real satellite up there. <laughs> okay, so now I've shown you also how you can have uh, perfect synchronization in many different ways. We can also have variations of synchronization, which is... Uh, this business of real exact synchronization or phase synchronization. So there is a framework for looking at all of them together. It's called generalized synchronization. Surprise, surprise. All right? <laughs> okay. So this generalized uh, uh, synchronization, I'm not sure what this is, but anyway, this is complete synchronization, phase synchronization. I don't know why again. And... Uh, I should change that all to almost all other forms of synchrony that have been seen. Uh, people talk in terms of lag synchrony. That is, things are exactly the same, but at a small difference in time. Okay? Uh, there's also, uh, what, oh, there's this, there's relay synchrony. I mean, you name it, there's probably a ver version of uh, synchronization. Uh, that, okay? So I just want to point out that four systems uh, are a very fruitful way of thinking in terms of uh, different types of synchrony. Uh, so if you think of a forced oscillator, for example, um, okay, exercise in elementary mechanics, uh, so here is an oscillator with frequency omega naught, and if I force it with another oscillator of frequency omega, you know what solutions are obtained. Uh, these solutions are, uh, de depending on whether omega is equal to omega naught or, uh, or, or not, then you just find behavior of uh, one kind. You have beats and so on and so forth. Now, I just want to point out that f cosine omega t can itself be seen as the, it can be seen as the solution of this equation. This, this equation for a specified initial condition, right? the second equation over here, is another oscillator equation. And this solution is just A cosine omega t. Right? So if I were to go back to this equation over here, look at F cosine omega t, right? A is equal to F, right? then this is just Q double dot plus whatever, omega naught squared Q equals Y. That is... So, so I've got two equations of motion. One is independent of the other. This is just in mathematics called skew product, right? Or you can think in terms of master. Well, not quite master and slave, but this is your drive, which is not affected by the response. This is a drive response system. So you have a drive and a response. Okay, but now both these systems are not the same. I can't say why is the master because the slave, the way in which I think of master and slave is that democracy, master and slave without the coupling are identical or very close to identical, right? So here I'm not, I, I couldn't care what omega naught is. I could even have a nonlinear oscillator being forced. I mean, this methodology would still go through, but there'd be just two different systems. One is the drive, the other is the response. Yeah? Okay. No. Um, so the idea here is that uh, we have for a long time been studying these drive response systems as examples of, as interesting examples of dynamical systems, all right? Okay. Now, when systems are non, you know, the, the thing is to go back. Oops. 
and what I want to think of is the following. I've got my drive system, which is giving some oscillations. Here it's a harmonic oscillator. But it could be any old, any, any equation that has some kind of oscillatory solutions. And I take that and put it back. Here again, it's driving a harmonic oscillator. But it could be any other equation. And it would be uh, the output from here driving that. In the extreme example, one can think of having, let's say, one Lorenz oscillator. That's giving rise to some oscillations, which give you some kind of chaotic forcing. And that could be fed into, let's say, the Rossler or another Lorenz, or whatever, you know what I mean? So, because the interaction between different systems is very important, right? OK. Now, uh, then what, what, what does one get, OK? So this is the general uh, methodology that has been applied. I mean, what I was suggesting was just this, that I have some equations which oscillate, and you notice that this equation doesn't involve Q. Here I've got another equation which has its own dynamics, and then it gets affected by Y. We'll see other ways of, uh, of writing such equations momentarily. OK, so the, I mean, the point that I've already made is that um, Eventually, when we see some kind of resulting dynamics occurring on a lower dimensional uh, invariant submanifold of M of the phase space, which is the synchronization manifold, all this means is that you come onto this lower dimensional subspace and then you stay there. If your synchronization is stable, if your subsystem Lyapunov exponents are uh, negative, then once you have come onto that submanifold, you're going to just stay on that submanifold, right? There's another way of thinking about it, which says that if I've got these two systems, X and Y, which are coupled to one another, again, in an abuse of notation, uh, X and Y refer to the variables of these two other systems. So it could be X1, X2, X3, Y1, Y2, Y3, right? OK? When this happens, the implication is that y is uniquely determined by x. So I have y, which is some functional of x. Right? Okay. So this is the paradigm of uh, generalized synchronization, that two systems could be dissimilar. You couple them. It's not perfect synchronization, but if it's going on to a lower dimensional submanifold over there, the, you, it's possible to have, uh, you know, think of uh, one of the systems as being uniquely determined by the other. Okay? And, all right. So the one way in which you would think about it is the following. If you have some drive which is affecting the response, okay, let's just consider this case, that you have a drive which, which you then apply onto the response and you get something that looks like a complete mess. Meaning, you've got some chaotic drive or an aperiodic drive, it doesn't matter. You've got a response, whatever it is, and you look at what is the output. Right? Pecora Carroll, the drive was identical to the response, and so if you had a chaotic drive over here, your response was identical. Yeah? It was on that diagonal line. So the way in which people discovered and then discussed generalized synchronization in the 90s was to say that, let me make another copy of the response system. Because the response systems intrinsically are chaotic, they are evolving any which way. But after the drive has, uh, has uh, been applied to this response system and comes up with one output like that, when it applies onto the copy of the response system, 
it should come out with the same function because of that functional relationship, which means that the two responses should be in perfect synchrony. Drive hits response one, you get some output. It hits response two, you get the same output. Okay. So th this, is, this is the basic idea of generalized synchrony. And let me just show you how that works in a very simple system. Right? Now, this is the logistic map, which I presume is boringly familiar to everybody. Okay, so for the case of the logistic map, right, I've got my, I'm taking Mr. X as the drive. Right? And the response are the, is Y, and this function is this little function over here, because even I got tired of just saying 4X into 1 minus X. This is 4 square root of X into 1 minus square root of X, it's the same doesn't matter, all right? So your response is the same, and here is the additional driving term. So when epsilon is equal to zero, these two are just completely uncorrelated. Well, not completely, because things tend to concentrate at various points, but you get, I mean, it fills up almost this entire phase space over there. This is x on this axis and y on that axis. If I take another copy of y, which I have now indicated by y prime, uh, I, I also get, you know, if I look at y versus y prime, see x versus y or y prime is going to look something like this. y versus y prime is uncorrelated. So it's just filling up that space. For, uh, for in increasing this coupling epsilon over here, let me just describe what happens to x and y. X and Y go from being this space to this, all right? Some complicated thing which I don't know. This is not a simple function. But then I increase the coupling even more. And then, lo and behold, I'm on that synchronization manifold. X is equal to Y. But now let's look at Y versus Y prime, all right? When this value of the coupling has been reached, y versus y prime is identical. So x versus y is this mess. x versus y prime is the same mess. Right? So the two messes are on this synchronization sub-manifold over here. Right? Increase the coupling more, x is exactly equal to y, x is exactly equal to y prime, y prime is equal to x prime, everything is equal in, on this line. All right? So it's this intermediate, uh, this intermediate picture that will give you an idea of what is generalized synchronization. The response is complicated. We don't know what it is. All right? But any two systems will have the same identical response. Because there is a unique functional, I mean implicit, I don't know what this functional is, because I mean, who can tell what, what gives that? All right? So one drive, many responses. There is a regime when all the responses give you the same output. And that is, in a sense, and I'll, I'll, in the next class, we'll discuss why it's called generalized synchronization. Um, OK, I'll give you a preview of what is to come. Uh, OK, I'll, just some fact let me mention. This coupling actually turns out also, you can replace the coupling by noise. So you have noise acting on one system noise acting on another copy of the same system, if the noise is identical, the response will become identical. Okay, this has got important applications, especially in things like ecology and so on and so forth, um, something called the Moran effect and so on. But what I'm saying is that this is actually a very general framework. 
if I think of two systems subject, here they are subject to similar coupling, but if I make them uh, subject to noise or to periodic oscillations or to quasi-periodic oscillations or whatever, the response is, becomes identical after a while. Exactly identical. Okay. These are usually called common noise. If I've got, so you can, if you think of two, you know, two nonlinear systems in a common bath, heat bath or something, you know, they're all given the same fluctuations, not the same spectrum of fluctuations, the same. Okay, all right. So uh, this is it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, usually for most couplings, it's not very long. It just goes quickly. All right. So this is the point that I just made, that the so-called external drive can be even a stochastic drive. And in many applications, in, you know, at least current kinds of applications in complexity, uh, this is actually an important thing. Okay. What I want to do is to now go back and say that if synchronization is, the, is sort of bringing everything onto a common sub-manifold, can I choose my manifold? Does it always have to be either this line which is uh, diagonal or we saw some example of anti-diagonal? Um, maybe I can have the, my own sub-manifold of choice. Will I still call it synchronization, and how, does, how do I make sure that it happens? So I want to now think of all of synchronization as basically going on to a submanifold in your phase space. Okay. Monday. Okay, very good. So now we take, uh, we have a group photo. So please 